Uh, Todd, thank you uh, so much for being with us at the Scripture Ministry Lecture. Wonderful talk yesterday. It's probably one of the, uh, the few that I can uh, say that most pastors, I would, all pastors, I would encourage to uh, listen to that video. What a, what a um, witness you are uh, to the church. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, Taylor, thank you for being with us this morning. I know you've um, also thought quite a bit on the topic of, of suffering and death. And uh, so we just wanted to continue the conversation a little bit that you started yesterday um, and um, that you've been uh, having for some time now with the church more broadly in this wonderful book that you've uh, re uh, written, Rejoicing in Lament, that, that shares your own story with some deep theological reflection. So let's just start the conversation today uh, with what you told us yesterday was, has been one of the more controversial, controversially received chapters, uh, the one related to praying for healing. So just tell us a little bit more about the chapter, um, what you're doing with it, why it was perhaps a little controversial. Yeah, well, I think the chapter is controversial partly because um, it's just a difficult thing to know how to pray for healing for someone when a disease is incurable. I mean, should incurable even be part of a Christian vocabulary? That's, I think, a legitimate um, question. Um, but for many people, many Christians who have incurable diseases and um, terminal um, diseases, I think they often feel like people pray for them, but not with them. Mm. And so they often have their own prayer requests and petitions, but they're sometimes different than when we have, you know, a prayer team come in or people wanting to pray for that person. So in the chapter, I try to confess openly and clearly that God is the one who made our bodies and God can heal our bodies. God is free and God is free to work through medicine and God is free to work in other ways that stagger our imaginations. Um, but there are some situations, such as praying for someone with an incurable illness, where a prayer for healing always has to be accompanied with a prayer for lament. Mm. Because no matter what, there is loss there. So um, with my particular cancer, for example, um, if I was, you know, if I received healing and had absolutely no cancer in my body. I would still have to stay on a pretty intense chemotherapy for the rest of my life. Mm. Um, at least the doctors would want me to because even if there is no cancer, um, with this cancer, it always comes back. <laughs> that, is, that is at least what doctors say. And so, when I received prayers that were just asking God to turn back the clock as if this never happened, as if I could just live my life before what my life was like in the fall of 2012, um, it feels like this is not praying for me where I'm at and kind of tramples on some of the loss. Now, you know, as a, as a cancer patient, you know, I appreciate all prayers <laughs> from, from people. And, you know, God will perfect all of our petitions in the, in the intercession of Jesus. Um, and so it's not like I'm saying, you know, you have to pray perfectly. But um, I know from other cancer patients as well, um, sometimes they, sometimes they get very, very angry, actually, when they get prayers that are kind of a quick fix, we're going to turn back the clock, because they're now on a path that is a much harder path than they had been on before, and they, want, they need God's strength and help on that path. Um, and so, um, I think that some struggled with that chapter, because it's hard to hold those together to say, God is completely free to heal us, yet some things can happen to us that are just, you know, losses that can't be undone. And the, 
the best way I tried to describe it is just that praying for someone with an incurable disease is like praying for someone who's lost a limb. Mm. You pray for them and they have needs and you pray for healing, but in a different sort of way. Um, yeah. I really appreciate the distinction between praying for someone and praying with them. I think it's immensely helpful. The approach of praying for someone, I think, can, you know, unfortunately communicate uh, something that we don't want to say, which is your disease, your sickness is a problem. It's a problem for us. And if we could just overcome that problem, if we could find a quick fix to it, then we'd all feel better. And, you know, mm -hmm. us included. Mm -hmm. Even though it's done in the spirit of prayer, I think it can be a profoundly uh, theological gesture hmm. because it's not open to the horizon of what God might do in the midst of that suffering. Not only what God might teach the person who is themselves suffering, but the community around them yeah. And, yeah. and extend a kind of patience um, a, a, a Christological patience waiting to see, you know, how God can restore things to not just back to what was, but go beyond that. So I, I think it's a profoundly impatient kind of prayer to pray in that way without, without leaving room for lamentation. I don't know. Does that yeah. yeah, I think you're, you're exactly right. Um, Taylor with that. I mean, one dynamic of having a serious illness and then being open with your community about it is that you do just have to get a little bit of thick skin at times yeah. in that um, people will say things that will try to be very helpful and they're not always, you know, very helpful. So you say you have cancer and you know, the next thing they'll mention is, oh, you know, my mother just died of cancer or, you know, oh, I know somebody with that cancer and they've been in remission a really long time. So mm -hmm. either, neither of those are actually super helpful because um, one, <laughs> yeah, um, it, it kind of sets up the expectation one direction or another, but you, you just can't really take it personally. But that is true sometimes when Christians pray for other Christians mm. with serious illness. At times it does feel like it's more about <laughs> some of what they are bringing in response. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I've felt it's almost like, um, you know, we we're, we're praying for Todd to return to a middle-class lifestyle so that he can retire and see his grandkids and you know, pursue the American dream. Mm. And um, that's, I think, not how God works. Mm. I mean, that's that horizon that you were talking mm. about mm. that, um, I mean, I want people to pray for God to work in the midst of this. Mm. I mean, we serve a God in Jesus Christ whose power is made known in weakness. And mm. so, yes, pray for healing, also pray, also lament but also be open to the strange ways in which God works. Mm. Um, and when it's just a prayer to turn back the clock, mm. I think sometimes it shows the way in which, you know, we confuse um, a Christian vision of the future with the American dream mm. and the sense that, um, you know, God owes us a long life to live to 70 and 80 and this is you know God's mighty plan and um, God is shows up in and God both hides and shows up in mm -hmm. peculiar places and we of all people who belong to the crucified Lord should should know that mm -hmm. so yeah your chapter um, I found particularly fascinating the way you um, really, in a sense, deconstructed our language of prayer and how unchristian it is. Taylor's already talked about, and you referenced the way you talk about prayers as fixes. Um, 
you talk about prayer as impatient. Another one that, that Taylor brought up that um, the fix also undoes a kind of patience and long suffering that we should have with God. Um, the way that unconfessed sin becomes the answer or lack of faith is mm -hmm. the way that we mm -hmm. articulate um, what happens when prayer isn't. Um, right. So if you pray healed. for someone who's ill and they're not healed, then the person it, it, you're praying for gets blamed. And mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it, it was an interesting chapter uh, in the way that your long, steep theological tradition came to bear in your encounter uh, with your sickness and with the, the way the people of God prayed for you. I wonder if, um, if you had any comments in terms of, uh, it, as you were even just mentioning, the way that we've turned God and our prayers into a hope for our modern uh, American life. Wondering if you have any thoughts in the sort of theological assumptions that are undergirding the way that we're approaching prayer in our society, the way that we pray for people um, mm -hmm. instead of with people. Lack of lament was one that uh, Taylor's already touched upon as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I guess Taylor, too, you too, if you guys have thoughts on mm -hmm. the way that prayer culture that we have mm -hmm. is perhaps more turning God into a puppet for our, yeah. our desires, another rich image that, you, that runs throughout your book. Mm -hmm. uh, any thoughts? On the, on the implicit theology in our prayer? Yeah, I mean, I think that in our implicit theologies of prayer, we see all of our um, implicit and functional theologies, you know, mm -hmm. coming to fruition. So we can see, you know, what do we belie really believe about um, salvation and what God is, how God is active and so forth. And I do want to say, um, you know, there's, there's, I raise these concerns about prayer, but I'm, immensely thankful for um, the prayers that I've received. Um, and, um, and so many who have um, prayed for me have prayed with me. Um, they've been present to me and, you know, maybe prayed a psalm or um, there's, I mean, some of, the, some of the biblical standard is, you know, if you are um, mourning with those who are mourning and rejoicing with those who are rejoicing, then you're probably praying with, you know, rather yeah. than, rather than um, for. Um, but I think that sometimes we really want to be the heroes of prayer. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a situation where there's an answer to prayer, and then the person that you tell the answer to said, oh, I've been praying for you, in a way that kind of says, thank me. You know, <laughs> as, if, yeah, <laughs> as, if, um, as if we are the ones who are going to be the saviors. And I actually, I mean, I re even received some cards that were you know, very well, very well intentioned, but just you know, cards from the bookstore that had long statements about the power of prayer is, you know, greater than any other power in the world. And it didn't even mention God. Mm. Um, and, you know, so do we believe in the power of prayer or do we believe in the power of God? Mm. And those, those things, I think we can easily get confused mm -hmm. in a sense. There's so. a paragraph from your book where I thought you got that point, the rhetorical power. At times I receive prayers that seem to make the one praying the hero of the prayer as if the prayer warriors were the primary actors in prayer, with God filling an ancillary role. I recall one card that I received with a poem about there being no power on earth greater than the power of prayer. Mm, yeah. But the eloquent poem made no mention of God. Ouch. Do we believe in God or do we believe in the power of prayer? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think prayer for us as Christians is like breathing. I mean, we we are not only called to do it, it's part of our identity. Um, but we do it as ones who belong to Jesus, the Lord, through the Holy Spirit. It's the triune God who is the central actor. <laughs> um, and God isn't just, you know, um, sitting back, not paying attention until, you know, the prayer workers click God into action. Um, but we're actually joining in through the Spirit um, with Christ's own petitions and laments um, and his own work on our um, behalf. And that's one of the reasons that I found the best 
sort of practical guidance in addition to using the Psalms for praying for, for someone with illness and praying petitions is the Lord's Prayer. Mm. I mean, join Jesus in his prayer, um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven. And, you know, some Christians kind of stiff arm that and say, well, you know, we shouldn't say your will be done. We need to sort of name it and claim it. And um, uh, yeah, if Jesus himself said, thy will be done, <laughs> as he did um, when he prays in Gethsemane, um, I think that is our prayer as well. So there's a lot of people um, who are struggling with sickness themselves and having a hard time with the way people are responding to them but don't know exactly what to say. And on the other hand, there are many people who have sick ones in their lives who want to pray but don't know how to pray. Uh, practically, Taylor, I know you've walked uh, along dear friends who have died um, or, and uh, had sickness, uh, been sick as well. And uh, so how would you, um, what kind of practical advice would you give to people in terms of what it is to walk with a person and pray with a person in the midst of uh, all that's wrong and broken with the world. I mean, I mean, I think be present with that person. Um, ask them how you would like to pray. And sometimes we have to pray on behalf of others. Sometimes you know, we, uh, sometimes I didn't have the energy just with all the chemo and steroids and things um, to figure out what to pray for. So, you know, pray for me when I can't pray. This is some of what the body of Christ is, is for. But we need to give the person um, a chance to, to say, actually, as well, what to, what to pray for. Um, and I mean, I think walk with them as a brother um, or sister in Christ. Um, I don't think there's a great, there's not a great formula um, because you know, each situation of loss and suffering is different. But um, I might just mention two patterns that I've seen. Um, one is um, that if you have a crisis, you have a person, the sort of person most affected by the crisis and then family members who might be sort of the inner circle and then you have congregation and friends. So we sort of move to these outer type circles. One thing that often happens is somebody kind of on more of an outer circle, like a friend, will go perhaps to the spouse of the person who is in serious illness and say, I can't handle this. Like, I, I don't think I can move forward. Um, and so, you know, then people on the inside are, in a sense, sort of trying to take care of <laughs> people on the outside. And this is a problem for pastors mm -hmm. too, right? Because it is hard to keep praying and caring for people. So my suggestion is if look and see where you are on the circle and find care for yourself on with someone else who's farther out from the circle. Don't, you know, go to the family member or things like that of those in the crisis. Always be looking inward and bringing them before the throne of God um, and, you know, praying for them in, in that sense. Everybody is in need, right, mm -hmm. when a crisis happens. But um, sometimes we just don't really think about, you know, how these different different aspects um, work. Um, and then the second pattern I've seen is when there's a serious diagnosis, um, I've had this happen with a number of friends where there's a huge response from church and otherwise in the first couple of months. But then two years later, three years later, they're still dealing with the effects of this loss. And every day, the effects of this loss has new implications for them. It's not like a one-time thing, but their congregations moved on and doesn't really think about it anymore. And I, I mean, um, I'm blessed with a congregation that has continued to really um, care, but um, this is a 
this is a pattern that I've seen just to be aware of. Um, so, you know, if you see a, a ton of people responding when there's an immediate crisis and you're a friend or something, you know, it's perhaps okay to step back a little bit and then, mm. you know, contact in a month or two, is there, you know, a way I could bring a meal or be, you know, present to you because these things tend to blow over really quickly for the people who are not involved. That's really helpful. The, it, it reminds me of, I had the opportunity uh, to, uh, to make an important visit to a friend who had, had just gone from treatment to hospice care. And, uh, it, you know, making the big trip to go visit him I'm, you know, trying to rehearse lots of <laughs> yeah. um, prompts. I'm reading. I'm, I'm trying to prepare myself to to pray well for him, to be present for him, and and very much putting myself <laughs> in, in in a privileged place of action. And I learned a lot um, when I arrived mm. at about how much he and his wife were just struggling with the help that that was on offer the you know the the visits the friends of friends that know someone who would like to come and pray yeah, or yeah, yeah. you know the you know well-intentioned interventions and yeah. and and appointments and suggestions and how all those things mount up and for someone who's obviously struggling with a severe illness you know just the energy to yeah, try and it's huge. not I mean there's not energy to rebuff the, those yeah. those efforts but to tolerate them yeah. is such a drain mm -hmm. um, and I, I learned in those moments maybe the best thing I can do is just be present and 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 not um, and and bear the silence of the moments where my friend is resting and mm -hmm. and waiting till he has some some more energy for what for, for whatever he wants to do. Yeah. It was a very prayerful time for me, you know, those um, hours of just waiting with him. But it's not at all what I expected mm -hmm. to do when I you know when I took the trip. Um, and so I'm, I'm aware of, of all the ways in which, um, you know, as we've been talking and reflecting on how prayer interfaces with theology, it, it, it might seem strange, but, um, you know, the old Latin adage, lex or oriandi, lex credendi, you know, what we pray reveals what we believe is very true. And our modern life is consumed with... Um, avoiding death at all costs and and that does impinge upon our prayer and that does impinge upon our theology in ways that I think you really helpfully point out in the book create an, an unfortunate and and almost tragic distance between the experience of Christians in North America and Christians around the world mm -hmm. and in in, in more developing regions of the world where sickness and death is, is more of a daily reality. And we know that it definitely was in the biblical world. Um, so how much we can commune with our brothers and sisters around the world or how much we can um, s share in the perspective of the, the biblical authors and the, and the characters of the Bible is, I think, profoundly affected by how much work we're doing on a daily basis to avoid the reality of death that we carry, that we all carry it around with us all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the, uh, maybe I'll just really quickly comment on this and we could pick it up more in the next uh, discussion that we're having, but uh, often when we think prayer, we assume petition. Uh, a major part of what you've been saying and very much ties in with what Taylor was just talking about is uh, the way in which our prayers and our worship have ne neglected the aspect of lament uh, in the life of the church. And maybe just as a, as a sort of final comment in, in this discussion, 
the role of prayers of lament. Many Christians wouldn't even necessarily know what it means to speak of a prayer of lament. Uh, I think that's related even to the presence that you're speaking of with your friend, just being there in your prayerfulness mm. with him. Uh, what, what does it mean to, uh, to have prayers of lament? How the, has the Psalms shaped your own um, experience of God and relationship to God in the midst of it? And yeah, just what, is the, what does it mean to pray uh, prayers of, to have, to give, to send to God prayers of lament? Yeah, I mean, the prayers of lament are the most common type of psalm. Over a third of the psalms are prayers of lament, and they bring um, both grief and anger, sometimes protest. Um, before God, they cry out to God, um, all on the basis of God's promise. And they trust God's promise enough to say, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you hiding your face from me? Why do you not remember me? When you think about all of those questions, all of those are kind of inversions of covenant promises mm -hmm. that you know, God um, has chosen his people, that God remembers his people, um, you know, God will never forsake his people. Mm -hmm. But life does not always feel like that. And often, you know, and I don't think we should expect it um, to always feel as if God's fulfilling his promises. Um, until the final kingdom comes, you know, Paul says that um, we will be lamenting with the Spirit. It's the Spirit who groans in us. And um, so, you know, a laments bring these emotions and responses of anger and grief. They don't just bottle them up. Um, but on the other hand, it's not just sort of venting before God. I mean, there's, there's a sense in which, yes, you, you, know, you, you put those emotions out there and their psalms are so raw, um, but it puts them out there in such a way that it's focused on God's promise. And so it kind of, it refuses to let God off the hook. Um, and it wrestles with God. And I know in my um, cancer journey, particularly as I would think about my young children and the effect of my diagnosis on my wife and young children, um, sometimes I felt like the Psalms of Lament were kind of one of the only places where I was understood mm. um, to just join into their prayers, um, bringing all this before God. And you know, when something like this happens at any given moment, you can't feel all the emotions of what is going on. I mean, I'm still processing my diagnosis from three years ago. Um, but when you go to a psalm of lament, it evokes it out of you. It gives you a path, and it gives you a path for bringing this before the Lord. So I really think that psalms of lament need to be um, rediscovered by um, not just individuals, but by congregations. Um, as they really have been for much of um, Christian history. They need to be part of our worship because um, it, it points to who we are. Um, we are people who say that this world with its death and violence is not the way things are supposed to be. We belong to King Jesus, and this is not the way King Jesus runs things. Um, his, he is king, but his kingdom has not yet fully come. And so in the meantime, what does the Spirit do? The Spirit laments in us.